assembling bags of food for children within our local school system at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, January 2nd, in the weight room. See Glenda Broom if you would like to learn more or become a volunteer. Please sign your attendance on the registers and then pass them along. If you would like some information about St. Paul, please give a contact number and someone will get in touch with you. If you decide today is the day you would like to join St. Paul, please come down when we sing the last hymn and join the pastor here in front. My thought for the day comes from an unknown source. From success you get a lot of things, but not that great inside thing that love brings you. Please prepare your hearts for worship.
Apostles' Creed, number 881, in your hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
and now you'll see the prayer request that we have on your bulletin. I'll just give you an update on Jean Schumann. Uh, she did have a rod put in her leg. She broke the femur in her leg at the VA hospital. She was working there and took over uh, an item. And so she's in rehab right now at 4215 at St. Francis Paint Hospital. So she's at 61st in Yale. Uh, we have to identify the, the hospitals because there's so many St. Francis's now. So uh, she is there. Uh, she is in rehab. So there will be times that she'll be away. Uh, if you go up to see her, she may be out getting some of that rehab that she needs to get done. Uh, she said she may be there two weeks and then she may go to an assisted living for just a little bit so she can still get her strength. So please keep her in your prayers if you will. Uh, Mary Pat was just in the hospital with some breathing problems, but she's out of the hospital now. And you can see the rest of the folks that are on our list here. Some are with us today. Susan Ashton is here and uh, others that are here on our list too that we are pleased that they're doing so well that they are uh, back in church with us again. Joanne Murray Hogan lost her son, and we do want to continue to keep uh, her, in her prayer, in our prayers as uh, the funeral was just the day before Christmas Eve. So please keep that family in your prayers. And also the Ballure family, too. Uh, we do want to continue to be with them. Keep them in prayer. Uh, their daughter-in-law did pass away, and uh, that funeral service was in California. So please keep them in your prayers as we will. We uh, certainly want to pray for Indonesia right now because they've had a tsunami. They're still trying to discover how many people were lost in the flooding that happened. But that nation has been under quite a bit of problems. Earthquakes have happened, and two tsunamis, and a typhoon. So please keep them in your prayers as they are trying to recover from all of that. And then, of course, our, our friends and family, and actually part of us, uh, Puerto Rico, we still need to keep them in our prayers too as they are still trying to recover and still trying to get the assistance as needed as well as the many tornado folks just around our area on up through the rest of the United States that have experienced the tornadoes that have happened during the December. I'm going to kneel here at the altar. If there are others that would like to come and kneel at the altar, you're welcome to do that. At the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, we'll return back to our seats again. So let's pray. Oh God, it's so good to be in this place on this Sunday just before the New Year's. We thank you that we can gather together to remember all the answers to prayers that you've given to us in 2018. Thank you for walking with us through the victories, but also for walking with us in those those valleys that we had to pass through during this past year. We thank you for your constant love to us and for the way that you're showing us your grace in all things. Lord, whenever we come into your presence, we are mindful that we're sinners in need of your grace. And so we thank you that as we confess our sins, you're faithful and just and will forgive us of all of our sins in Christ Jesus. So we thank you for that today. Lord, we thank you also for the many people here in this congregation for you are journeying with us. We thank you for all that you've done in our bodies. We pray that you continue to touch us physically. We pray that you touch us mentally also from the stresses of this past holiday and all the experiences of looking to the new year. We pray that you will give us strength and help us to put all of our worries and our concerns into your care. And Lord, we pray that you'll help us to grow spiritually. Uh, we want to continue to know who you are because we eventually will come home to you and so we want to continue to know you better and better so we can praise you even more as we come into your presence. Lord, we thank you for each person that is on our mind today and with prayer requests, family members, and friends that are going through special crisis at this time. We pray that you'll be with them, walk with them in their journeys. We pray for those that are grieving, those that have lost loved ones over this past year and have gone through the holidays alone. Be with them. And Lord, we pray for the many folks that are still traveling along the roadway. Bring them safely back to us once again so that we can continue to worship together. Lord, we do pray for our world today. There's so many concerns around us. The Korean Peninsula that still needs a touch from you. 
as we look towards a lasting peace. We pray for continued conversations with China. We pray that you'll be with that nation and our nation as we work together for a lasting uh, terror concerns and other concerns that are there. Lord, we do pray that you'll be with our many troops as they are deployed and moving back to the United States again. We pray that you'll be with them and we pray you'll put your hand upon them in Afghanistan and Syria because during these changes very often it becomes volatile. So we pray for the men and women serving, bring them safely back to their families again. We pray for all service men and women serving around the world that you'll keep them safe. And we thank you, Lord, for their obedience in serving our country. And watch over their families on this side as they wait for their family members to return. Lord, we do pray that you'll be with the, the nation of Indonesia, be with them as they seek to recover from the many disasters that have come their way. And we pray for the rescue agencies that are there trying to recover and find all those that were lost in the tsunami. Lord, we do pray also that you'll be with those in Puerto Rico. We pray that you'll be with them as they rebuild their country. And we continue to pray for all those that have been devastated by hurricanes around the world in typhoons. Be with them. Lord, we thank you for our own nation as we continue to deal with budget crisis and concerns. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to work with our finances, be with those in leadership. Help us as we work together so this government shutdown can stop. Lord, we do pray that you'll be with the many leadership changes coming about across the nation with our own governor, the uh, new governor coming into place. We pray that you'll be with Governor Stitt, his family, and uh, his cabinet as he composes the cabinet together and with our legislators as they meet together, be with them as they deliberate about the future of Oklahoma. And we pray, Lord, for our own city or county that you'll be with us. We pray for our ministers in this area. We know that you're continuing to walk with us. Help us as we reach out to this community to your love and continue to strengthen us each day. Lord, we pray for those on our prayer list that you'll be with them, some that are here today, some that are recovering at home, you'll be with them. We pray for those still on dialysis, chemotherapy, that you'll be with them. We pray for strength for them and those that are grieving for Joanne Murray Hogan and for others grieving today, the believers, we pray that you'll be with them. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you for the way that you bless us each day. And we pray now that you'll be with us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our children are about to come forward now as we sing the next hymn. We'll remain seated as we sing number 227. The friendly beast as the children come forward.
Okay, hi, hi. <laughs> well, wow, what a Christmas, huh? Was it wonderful at your house? If it was wonderful, raise your hand. Yes, it was wonderful back there. Was it wonderful out here? Christmas is wonderful. And I hope you were able to share it with lots of families and friends. And we had a wonderful Christmas Eve here. It was really special. And I loved being here. <gasps> Christmas is just full of so many things. It's food. If I don't eat for another year, that would be good. You know? And it's always filled with lots of good food. <gasps> and maybe family and friends you haven't seen for a whole year get to come. Or some that maybe just live down the block and you see every day, but then it's special on Christmas Day, isn't it? That you get to see those people. And then let's see, there's something that's sometimes under the tree present. Now when we get upstairs, I'll let you all share with me your favorite present. So be thinking about that. But who got a, a favorite present? Everybody? Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. Me too. Me too. Mr. Jim, did you get a favorite? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He did. He did well. In fact, do you see what Mr. Jim's wearing? He's looking pretty uh, soft this morning, isn't he? I got him that blue sweater. Yeah. I got it. He really likes it, don't you? Yeah. He really likes it. Glad he said yes. Yes. And as much as he loves that sweater, as much as he loves that sweater and he's going to wear it and wear it and wear it, I just know it. You know, then he'll get worn. And maybe he'll get a spot on it. Or maybe he'll outgrow it. Hope not. But it, it will. It will go away. But you know, there's something special about a present that came on Christmas Day. It was God sent the special promise of Jesus down to the earth to live with us. He sent it in love. And you know, that's really the special present. In the Bible, it says, kindness and love will be with us our whole life. And we will live in the house of the Lord forever. I love that last part. Forever. So in other words, Jesus brought us love. And then he taught us how to love and be kind. And we're all kind here in the house of the, of the Lord, aren't we? We're all kind, but is this the only place that we need to be kind? Exactly. We know you need to go out. Because the house of the Lord is out there for all of us. So we need to take that present that Jesus gave us of love and he showed us how to be kind. And, and then we need to go out to the world because the world is the house of the Lord. And be kind and loving to all. And you know what? That is one gift that won't wear out that won't get lost, that won't get broken, and you won't now grow it. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you for these wonderful children that we have here this morning. We thank you for this beautiful church and all the wonderful church family. Be with each one of us as we take the gift of love out into your world and show kindness to all. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank you, thank you. It's time for the children to go to Children's Church. And as they do, we're going to sing Away in the Manger, verses 1 and 3. I believe this is. Remain seated as we sing number 217.
I get it accounted for from 2018, so be mindful of that because the church office will be closed tomorrow. I want to remind you also the points that is here are beautiful, but you're welcome to take them home with you after this service. Uh, they're, they can be beautiful at your home. And so if you'd like to take some of those with you, you're welcome to any of those left over will be used next Sunday in our service, but we will have way too many, and so you're welcome to take those home with you if you give it up points up. So we thank you for, very much for that too. We're going to ask our usherettes if you'll come forward now, and as they do, let's have a prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for every opportunity that we have to give to you from out of the blessing you give to us. We ask now your blessing upon these funds that are given. May they be used for your church locally and for around the world. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
Next Sunday, we'll still have our Christmas decorations up because it's Epiphany, and it's representing the time that the wise men finally made it. You know, that story, it took a while to travel to get there, 12 days, and normally January 6th is is Epiphany, the day of Epiphany, and it happens to be next Sunday, so it, you don't have to say, well, it's before Epiphany, after Epiphany, it is Epiphany. And so we're reminded that they saw the star and they were they found Jesus uh, at the house with Mary and Joseph and the babe. So it, a wonderful time of celebration. Uh, our way of celebrating, we'll be doing the covenant renewal service next Sunday. And that's the time when we make a covenant with God. It's a service that's been passed on down from the Episcopal Church to the Methodist Church. John Wesley uh, embraced it as something that he thought all of our churches should do. Actually, he says to do it on New, New Year's Eve, on New Year's Day, at the very beginning of the new year. But we're going to do it the sixth, okay? The youth are going to have a special get-together on New Year's Eve here at the church. Keep us in your prayers. 8 o'clock until 12.30. We'll be here, and then we'll be going home to get some rest. But uh, we are pleased to have them come. And i good to have Jim Thompson and Lee with our youth, too. So thank you, Jim, for that. Our scripture lesson today is from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Each year his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. Supposing that he was among the band of travelers, they journeyed on for a full day while looking for him among the family and friends. When they didn't find Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, Child, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replied, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother cherished every word Heart. And Jesus matured in wisdom and in years, in favor with God and with people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was more than 400 years ago that Martin Luther, the great reformer of the church, the Protestant leader, he proposed that the governments have compulsory public education. He said it this way, if the government can compel such citizens as are fit for military service to bear the spear and the rifle, how much more is it the right to compel the people to send their children to school? And then he closes with this. Because in this case, we're warring with the devil. Isn't that interesting that he says that education should be done because we're warring with the devil? Well, we probably wouldn't use that same terminology today that uh, we need education because we're warring with the devil. But we certainly understand that the lack of knowledge is ignorance. And ignorance is uh, kind of an imprisonment itself. When a person is unlearned and does not know how to read, they really become in society someone that can't be useful to society and society cannot use them because of their lack of reading skills. And the personal advancement is not there for those that cannot read, and also the ability and opportunities are not always there because of their lack of reading. One pastor describes it this way, he tells of his church interviewing for candidates for the janitor's position at the church. One man who wanted the job badly brought his 12-year-old his son along to read the application for him and to assist him in filling out the application. The man seemed capable and was quite eager, according to this pastor, but because of his particular janitorial position, he was going to require reading of the events 
the days on the calendar and also working those complicated heating controls on their own walls, he couldn't be hired. And so he was not able to be hired for the job. He was handicapped because of his inability to read. For clearly Jesus was not handicapped in his reading. He was able to read. He was knowledgeable of what was going on. And our scripture text lets us know today that this youthful Jesus was growing in his realization that he had a special relationship with God. And he also was a very serious student himself, according to what the scriptures say to us. The boy Jesus had an inquiring mind. And he wanted to know. He, he let his imagination fill up and wanted to go to a place where wisdom was being shared, and that was in the temple. And so he was listening in. There's a classic painting out there of the biblical scene by Hemrick Hoffman, and he has Christ in the temple in his picture. And it shows the young Jesus, he's surrounded by these marveling scholars all wanting to listen to this little boy. Well, I'm not sure that's exactly the way it happened, that all of them were gathered around Jesus. It could have been Jesus was just on the outskirts, and he heard these elders of the Sanhedrin talking together, and he listened in. He wanted to get closer, and he got in a little closer, and finally he was sitting down on the front row. And he noticed all the people were asking questions, and they were wanting to know something more, and finally he said, I'm going to ask a question. So he started asking questions and they began to marvel at how much this little boy, Jesus, knew. It's amazing to us that Jesus was able to ask these questions. The audience was supposed to be scholars. These teachers themselves, they had a depth of understanding that Jesus wanted to know. But Jesus was being welcomed into the community. We need to at least give gratitude to these elders, not saying, hey, little boy, you need to go play on the playground. He didn't, that didn't say that to them. They simply said, let's answer the little boy's question. He wants to know. Let's share it with him. And so it's wonderful for us to hear that Jesus was being welcomed in. But it's also interesting for us to see that Jesus was so mesmerized about what was going on, the education he was getting, that he forgot about his parents. He forgot that he was on the journey. He forgot that they were leaving. And so he just stayed and he listened in and listened in. And you know, finally his parents did encounter him. And they said to him, Jesus, didn't you know we were worried about you? And he said to them very clearly, why were you worried about me? Didn't you know that I needed to be about my father's business? I needed to listen in to the father and be in his house. We can well imagine what it was like for Jesus at that time. He was just simply wanting to inquire. He wanted to grow. He wanted to, to really grow in his faith. If we look at our first question that you have in your sermon notes today, I think this is the one that I think we all need to focus on as we move to 2019. Our first question for the new year is this. How will you feed your soul in 2019? Not how will you feed your body, but how will you feed your soul? And how will you get your soul continue to be before God and to learn more from Him? Surely one message from this passage is the fact that Christianity allows for inquiring minds. That's something that we've always appreciated in the church, that we have open minds and open doors. And we want people to inquire and to learn about their faith. There's no question the Christian faith is for the uninformed because they can learn, the uneducated because they can help get their education here, and they also can help with those that are going through mental problems too because the church can offer that comfort, the strength that none other can provide. We sometimes have heard people say this about education, that education will destroy the children's faith, and no doubt, that there have been some situations where the intellectual pursuit of one child or one adult has gotten so much that they forgot about their faith altogether. But faith and reason, there's, there's no reason that they can't be compatible with each other. We can grow and learn from each other, and learning can help in, enhance our faith too. Jesus himself said that knowing the truth will make us free. And I think he was talking not just the truth of God, but also the truth of just 
have knowledge around us, knowing the truth. Plato, going to the word mythology, and said it was the worst thing that could happen to a person. A mythologist is a person who hates reasoning and concludes that intellectual acceptance of anything is of no value. That's what Plato says. And it's sad that, and it's true what mythology is, but it's a kind of an anti-intellectualism, and it even plagues our church even today, this anti-intellectualism. Many people we know are well informed in our churches. They have knowledge of the area that they possess, the profession that they're in. They have great knowledge, but when it comes to the skills of what it means to be a biblical person, to understand what God is all about, they have that grade school kind of education. They haven't gotten any more than what they may have learned in vacation Bible school or as a young child. The Bible needs to be our source book. It needs to be the place where we grow. The level of biblical illiteracy is quite high, even amongst church members. In 2013, the LifeWay Research Study asked regular church attenders, how often do you read your Bible outside of church? How often do you read your Bible outside of church? Well, 19% answered every day. 18% said rarely or never. And a quarter indicated they read the Bible a few times a week. And the rest answered, only occasionally do I read my Bible. Yet 90% of these same group of people said, I desire to please and to honor Jesus in all I do. You see, there's a problem there, don't you see? When I want to honor Jesus in all that I do, but I don't want to spend time reading the Bible. I don't want to spend time learning about Him. I don't want to spend time in prayer life. According to another survey, 82% of Americans believe God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible, but it's not. Americans in general have identified as being born again Christians did not do it any better than just people in America that's by 1%, they said, God helps those who help themselves. Is in the Bible. It's not. Faith leads us to believe certain things. But reason also helps us to know why we believe the things that we believe. And so we need to reason. We need to use our inquiring mind to understand a little bit more of why that scripture should affect me. And not just read it and say, okay, I read my scripture for a day and then put the book down and never say, how does that scripture apply to my life? How does that scripture affect me today and help me to be the kind of Christian that I need to be? How is it bringing me closer to God? In our disciple Bible study, one of the things that they would say to us is, every time you read the Bible, you need to ask the Bible three things. One, what does that scripture verse say to me about God? Who God is, what God is, what does it say about God? The second thing we ask that same scripture verse to do is what does this scripture tell us about humankind? What does this tell us about mankind, humankind? What does it tell us? And then, number three, what does this scripture tell us about the relationship between God and humankind? If you do that, you can be a preacher yourself because you've got three points right there. What does the Bible say to us about God? What does the Bible say to us about us? And then, how does that connect together? How does that make a relationship with us, with this God that we just read about and the humans that we know about ourselves because we are one? How does that relate to God? Our second question for this year, for this new year is this. What steps will you take to strengthen your faith in 2019? Notice my first question is, how are you going to feed your soul? The second question is, how are you going to strengthen your faith? I think we can do that in many ways. Out in our atrium area, we have the Upper Room. Great devotional book produced by the Methodist Church, and always a scripture at the top that you can read. Then you have a devotional that you can read. Under that is a prayer, and then usually a prayer focus for certain individuals. Uh, something related to the devotional that you read. That's one way that we can strengthen our faith because it's a daily devotional. Upper room.
room at daily devotional. We have also out there on the same table the daily bread. That is another devotional that can be used and be very helpful. Many of you have discovered that even on your cell phones, you can download an app called the Bible by the U version, Y-O-U version, and you can read the Bible daily just off your phone, and so you don't have to carry your big heavy Bible with you. You've got it on your phone, and you can read the scripture there, and if you look at that version of the Bible, then I can show you that app after the service if you'd like for me to show you, is that they have Bible plans there. You could actually look at a plan that's a seven-day plan, a six-month plan of reading the Bible, or reading the entire Bible in one year, and it will tell you you missed yesterday, you missed yesterday, or, or you're too far ahead, but it will help you with your spiritual growth and help you understand how you can grow in your faith. What do we need to do about our prayer life? Well, certainly we can go to the Psalms. Because the Psalms have wonderful prayers in them and can help us to focus our prayers even more. And we can read a psalm a day and we can begin to say, how does that apply to me and how can I make that a prayer to God for my life? Edward Dirksen, who was a great senator, he believed that we should read five psalms a day and one proverb every day during a month. And you can get through the entire psalms and the proverbs in one month's time. That's a good idea. Uh, some of those psalms are rather long for five chapters, but it's, it is a good way for us to get into the Bible and for prayer. Some people use the Book of Common Prayer. I've got that book. There is another book that's out called For Servants, for, for those prayer servants, and it has a weekly prayer guide for you. Certainly another way for us to learn about praying. But it's something that we need to do. It's a step that we can take in strengthening our faith. Not just saying we need to strengthen it. What are we going to do? And here are some examples of what you can do. Perhaps the plague of missiology is, missiology is the church shows up most clearly when we are talking about church mission. We begin to see that we're not getting it when we talk about church mission. For example... When we say our task is to love everybody, is the mission of the church is to love everybody, fine, but how do we do that? We can talk in generalities, but how do we specifically do that? How can we love everybody? And exactly what do we mean by the word love? Now that's something that we need to identify and try to reason with ourselves. What does love really mean? And we need to take the gospel to the whole world. This is what we hear from someone else as a mission statement for our church. But that's good, but how do we do that? How do we take it to the world? And do we mean just the world of people that we have around us? Or is that the entire world that we're speaking about? What is different about hearing the gospel and actually doing what the gospel says? Love it, Williams, who's a great... Uh, theologian and seminary leader, he said that whenever a preacher is approached by somebody and say, preacher, we need to start this program, maybe it's vacation Bible school, maybe it's a children's program, the minister should always respond by saying, so that, and have that person describe why that ministry is important, so that, and if you go to vacation Bible school, so that the children will understand the Bible themselves, so their parents, so that their parents can become involved in church. So that, and I think that's what we need to do with any program, any idea that God is putting on our heart for what our church needs to do, we need to say it is so that. So that, what is that going to do and how do we implement that? That gets to some of this answers to the generalities that we have so often about the church. Sometimes generalities we hear about in the church can cause us to react like the plaintiff did in a lawsuit that, that I heard about. He noticed that the defendant had two attorneys sitting with him while he himself had only one. So during the recess, he told his lawyer that he'd like to have a second attorney. And the lawyer said, well, why? I think I'm presenting your case very efficiently. Uh, in fact, I don't see how we can lose. The plaintiff answered this way, perhaps so, but the defendant has two attorneys. When one of them is up speaking, the other one is sitting and thinking. And when you're speaking, um, 
my sight, nobody's thinking. Nobody's thinking. He was beginning to realize there's a need for us to put thought together and, and work on those things together. And he felt like there's two attorneys that could help him and his case even better. We understand why church leaders like Martin Luther put such an emphasis on public education when he said, learning and thinking have long been viewed as something that can be worked as allies together for our faith and help us to grow. But of course, when we are talking about learning and uh, learning and thinking without faith is not the answer. We need to have faith. The famed preacher, Harry Emerson Fosdick, once said this, the worst kind of devil is an educated devil. The worst kind of devil is an educated devil. And another way to put it is this way. In the wrong hands, a beam of light can become a death ray. A beam of light can become a death ray. There's a supermarket tabloid that maybe some of you have noticed or bought yourself called Inquiring Minds Want to Know. And as we look at that tabloid, unfortunately, the newspaper's contents is inquiring mind is unfettered, unfaithful hearts often just because we want to be nosy and want to check out the scandals and the innuendos of somebody else. By thinking, our thinking has the power to spur us on in our spiritual formation, transformation. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Romans. He said this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. By the renewing of your mind. So he's saying it's not just a hard thing, but you need to get your mind transformed and move forward with God. Reason clearly has its limitations without faith, without God involved. But the claims of faith go beyond the realms of evidence of human understanding. But faith exists in directions suggested by reason. We reason and our faith helps that in formation. That's why often when I pray for you, when you're in the hospital, I'll pray not only for you and your surgery upcoming, but I'll pray for the physician to be guided by the great physician because very often doctors in the midst of surgery will say, I wonder if I did the procedure this way, if it would be better results. And many surgeons have discovered new procedures right there in the midst of surgery because God inspired them in the midst of the surgery. One person told me once, Preacher, I'm so glad you, you prayed that prayer that you guide the hands of, uh, that God would guide the hands of the persons there because one person said, I better check that chart one more time before we give them that dopamine. And sure enough, it would have killed the person that was on the table if they had not been listening to that special voice of God saying, check one more time. Even though you feel like everything's done, check one more time. He said, thank you, that prayer was answered. That prayer was answered. When we began to realize that our faith needs to have more development in our life. When I went to Old Roberts University and graduated there, the one thing that they talked about so often was the Trinity, not God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But they were talking about spirit, mind, and body. And what I began to realize and what I began to be taught is that we need to be looking at all those three things every day of our life. We need to be saying, what am I doing spiritually for myself today? What have I done to help exercise my spirit? Have I prayed today? Have I read the scriptures today? Have I talked to God at all today? I need to do that. The second thing we need to do is we need to exercise our minds. You know, our education didn't end when we got our diploma. When we walked across that platform, we need to continue to educate ourselves and to find out what God is saying to us and the reason that God is trying to give us to. And so it's important for us to begin to say, what am I doing to exercise my mind? Am I doing, am I playing those puzzles in the paper? Am I continuing to exercise that knowledge? One of our district superintendent's wife, who's now no longer district superintendent, but his wife said, I've discovered a new thing called TED Talks on television. And every day I'm listening to one TED Talk so I can begin to expand my horizons and begin to see new things in the world around me. 
You can do that with TED Talks. You can do that with PBS uh, channel and listening to new things and new developments. I just read an article the other day of how they developed a computer the size of a grain of rice. A computer the size of the grain of rice. The only problem is they don't know how to get a battery that small to keep it charged up. But the plan is someday have a computer implanted into somebody's tumor so that the moment they're receiving radiation or chemotherapy, they can, be, they can see immediately whether or not that tumor is reacting to the chemicals. And they can begin to bring that healing to see. Isn't that amazing? That that's what God is doing and we can begin to thank God that he's giving wisdom to people like that to develop those kinds of things. And it's not just the wisdom of those doctors, but God has given that wisdom. And we thank God for that. So what are you going to do for your spirit, mind, and body in 2019? What are you going to do each day? And how are you going to develop it? John Bailey, a Christian professor and writer who taught at the University of Edinburgh, died and his wife published some of her husband's writings, and in the biographical note to one of his books, she wrote this. There are three objects in my late husband's study that are symbolic of his career. The first one is the chair where he read. The second is the desk where he wrote. And the third is the pad where he knelt daily to pray. You see how she was able to see how he was putting it all together, was able to grow himself together. There's a hymn in 1763 by Charles Wesley, which he wrote for the opening of the school for children. The hymn is titled, Come Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that speaks to us of the Trinity, but the words that are included also is a prayer that the children in the school would pray, that God would unite the pair of so long disjointed knowledge and vital piety learning and holiness combined together. Jesus, I think, was showing us the wedding of thought and prayer when he went to that temple. He listened, he asked questions, he was in a public place, he taught and he gave profound answers to people. Sometimes Jesus even said a parable or two, and the disciples said, I don't get it, I don't get it. And Jesus was saying, you need to reason. You need to find what the answer is to that. And some, they, some of them, they would have to say, Jesus, we still don't get it. We've been talking, we can't get it. And Jesus would explain it to them. We need knowledge to inform our faith. We need it in our Christian faith to be a, we need to be a big supporter of education also. Because the pursuit of truth is so important in our world today. We need to have faith to put our knowledge into to work. The third question is this today. On this, at the end of the new year, how many Sundays will you commit to being present and participating in worship in 2019? We know that 52 weeks is maybe too much. But maybe you can say, I plan to be in church 40 weeks or 45 weeks. I'll be there as many Sundays as I can. But give yourself a number and saying I'm going to be there, that gives you a goal, a goal and an understanding that I need to grow in my faith, and I need to learn about my Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's start with a time of prayer. Almighty oh God, we want to keep the light burning. We've had the star of Bethlehem that has shown the light to the wise men. And we want to keep the light burning within us and we understand that there's things that we need to do to keep that light burning. We want to keep our faith and grow our faith. So help us, Lord, to understand how we can grow our faith. Help us to understand what we need to do ourselves to be determined to grow in spirit, mind, and body. And then, Lord, help us as we make a commitment to being with worship with you. So that we can learn of you each day and have our spirit challenged so that we can learn of you even more. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'd like to join our church, you're welcome to come forward as we sing our closing hymn number 251. Go tell it on the mountain, verses 1 and 3. Let's stand together as we sing.
with us from this place. Help us to be the disciples that you want us to be as we enter into this new year, 2019. Lord, we thank you for another year that we get to serve you and to walk with you. Bless us as individuals and as a church. Let us walk in your ways. For we ask this in Jesus' name.